Okay, I, I think we're going to get started because um, my introduction is about 20 minutes and I want to leave Joe some time for the talk. Um, <laughs> just, that's a joke. Okay, so Dr. Joe Pierre graduated from MIT in 1992 and then made the first of a series of really excellent life decisions when he decided to come to UCLA for medical school. And then he made another excellent decision when he decided to do his residency in psychiatry here in our residency program. Um, he also was a chief resident on the schizophrenia treatment unit at the VA in his senior year. He joined the faculty right after he graduated in 2000 and has had, I think, uh, what you could call a kind of garden variety, extremely successful academic career. He checks every single one of the boxes, and I'll go through them quickly. He's won awards for teaching at every level of his career as a faculty member, as a resident, for medical student teaching, for house staff teaching. He's uh, spent most of his clinical time at the West Los Angeles VA, where he's had multiple positions of leadership, administration, including, uh, I think now you're the acting chief of mental health community care systems. So that's a community responsibility. He's also been the chief of hospital services and the chief of inpatient. Um, there have been stretches of time that I know of when there was a rather dramatic turnover in the faculty at that facility. During that stretch, I think Joe would have been accurately described as the lodestar for the faculty. He kept everybody sane and functioning at the clinical level and at the administrative level and for the residency program. That doesn't show up in his CV, but it's a critical part of his accomplishments. Um, he was associate director of this residency program from 2007 to 2018 and basically ran every aspect of the program at the VA, including at the Sepulveda VA and the whole greater LA system. He uh, ha has had half a dozen and a half research grants. He's on the editorial board of about 50 different journals. He's published at least 42 peer-reviewed major articles, focusing mostly on treatment and, and other aspects of the care of schizophrenic patients, uh, substance abuse, schizophrenic patients with substance abuse. Um, He's published another 20 short articles and, and letters to the editor. Um, he's, he's produced dozens of posters, mostly focusing on treatment of schizophrenia. There's over 100 invited lectures and presentations in his CV. Uh, he's a, a little bit of a media hound, having been on all sorts of, you know, different appearing in different media, including, you know, television and radio and, and print. Um, he's also an artist. He's written a number of short stories. He's, he's produced at least one award-winning documentary film. Um, he's a pretty good natural athlete. I think at the retreat, he's always one of the best, if not the best, basketball players. Uh, he fouls a lot, I hear. Uh, and, and baseball players. Um, and so, you know, I think that all adds up to a sparkling academic career, but there is more. And this is the part that separates Joe Pierre from everybody else. Since 2014, he has been, I guess, publishing a uh, roughly bi-monthly blog for Psychology Today. Um, that, I just learned from him today that they've told him that he's got about a million viewers, readers. So if that's even remotely accurate, if a million people read what he has to say, he is not only the public-facing voice of academic psychiatry to the world, or at least the readers of that blog, but he's had probably 995,000 more viewers then we'll see any academic publication by any academic anywhere in the world. So in terms of being a thought leader and an influencer, Joe Pierre is the guy. Now, for somebody in that role, you really want 
let me just read you what the blog is described as. It's called Psych Unseen Brain Behavior and Belief draws from the perspectives of psychiatry, neuroscience, psychology, and evidence-based medicine to address timely topics related to mental illness, human behavior, and how we come to hold popular and not so popular beliefs. So to do that, you really need to do one thing that is really hard to find amongst academic psychiatrists. You need to think. You need to read a lot of stuff, a lot of research. You need to assimilate it and synthesize it and draw its lessons from it and then present it in an uncontroversial, rational, convincing way to skeptics. And I've, if you start reading his blog and just type in Joe Pierre, Pierre, Joe Pierre MD, you'll get to it right away. Pick anyone and don't plan anything for the next couple of hours because you're going to bounce around from one to the other because they're really fantastic reads. And I think there's very few people in the academic world that could pull this off as well as Dr. Pierre. So you're going to hear him talk about one of his favorite topics this morning. Um, you can read it. And uh, with no further ado, Dr. Pierre. So it turns out <clears throat> when you give a talk here, you can ask um, for suggestions about who can present you. Um, so I did put Jim down. Uh, I expected it to be more of a roast. So, uh, so that was very strange to actually hear you say really nice things. Kind of, kind of disappointed, actually. Um, but I pr appreciate it. Okay, so yeah. So I'm going to talk today about conspiracies, uh, conspiracy theories, which is indeed one of my favorite topics these days. I was asked to say a couple words about how I found myself interested in this topic. And... Uh, it is true that the older I get, the more I like to quote myself. So um, <clears throat> this is me uh, coming off an undergraduate degree in molecular biology and a minor in psychology. And I wrote this actually for my medical school essay. Knowledge of normal human processes is best, uh, often best obtained through the study of disease states, which I remember during some interviews, some people asking me about that and kind of challenging that idea. But that's really... Um, what has sort of happened inadvertently with my career. I started off as a clinical researcher uh, investigating schizophrenia and psychotic disorders um, at the VA. As a lot of people know, I, I worked on a specialty focused unit addressing psychotic disorders, which uh, unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But in any case, over the past five or 10 years, I've sort of shifted. I've become more interested in, in the gray area between psychiatry and normal behavior, and particularly around belief systems. Um, and in my free time, I'm still uh, trying to publish away, not only on the blog, but in academic uh, journals. So, for example, this is something I wrote last year about delusion-like beliefs. And conspiracy theories are really a subset of that. Uh, today's talk is uh, under review um, in a journal, so let's see if it gets published. Anyway, so I'm going to be talking to a, a little bit today about truth and to sort of get us in an epistemologic mood. I'm going to share a couple of quotations. Uh, that I think are, are good. Uh, so the first is by Susan Sontag. The truth is always something that is told, not something that is known. If there were no speaking or writing, there would be no truth about anything. There would only be what is. I think that's kind of profound. This one has some irony built into it. This is Galileo saying, in questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. So of course, if you think about that in the context of history, Galileo was to some extent a lone voice arguing against the predominant mode of thinking that was rooted in uh, religious beliefs. Now we're sort of flipped, as you'll see in this talk, where uh, we have individuals who are trying to refute scientific consensus. So I, I like that quotation for that reason. And here's a John Steinbeck quotation, which is very relevant today, to today's talk. An unbelieved truth can hurt a man much more than a lie. Okay, so conspiracy theories. This is my own um, perhaps idiosyncratic definition. Uh, I don't think there is an accepted de definition in academic psychology, for example. But the way I like to define a conspiracy theory is that it rejects an authoritative count of reality in favor of some plot involving a group of people with malevolent intent that is deliberately kept secret from the public. And so these days, I think we're all familiar with some conspiracy theories. 
Many of them uh, revolve around historical events, though especially relevant for the work that we do, many also relate to medical uh, themes. And so just as a, this is my only audience exercise for the lecture, but somebody look up there and tell me which of these conspiracy theories is actually true. So Jim votes for GOP controlled by the Russia, uh, Russians. Um, <laughs> must say that is the one that I believe. Uh, anyone else though? Somebody's gotta say Epstein didn't kill himself, right? Um, the one that actually historically is 100% true is the CIA mind control MK Ultra. So when you start learning about conspiracy theories and if you spend any time online, and I spend far too much time online, um, people know about these things, and, and I'll speak in a, in a later uh, about why I think that's relevant. So if we compare um, delusions to conspiracy theories, I think it's important to understand some differences. So delusions, by definition, are usually uh, thought to be false in as much as things are falsifiable. They tend to be idiosyncratic, and they tend to be non-shared beliefs, although, of course, there's a, a history of shared psychotic disorder. And I've always argued that the thing that makes delusions unshareable is that they often contain a self-referential component, meaning that we might have a lot of people in the audience who believe that God can talk to people. We might have a lot of people who might believe there might be a second coming of the Messiah. But if I told you that I was hearing the voice of God telling me that I was the second coming of the Messiah, probably it would be a lot harder to find people who shared that belief. So conspiracy theories, on the other hand, are not necessarily true or false, although, of course, if we find that they turn out to be true, we don't call them theories anymore. And pretty much by definition, uh, conspiracy theories are shared and lack a self-referential component. So if I believe something about the nature of what happened to President Kennedy and the assassination, it doesn't really have anything to do with me. In fact, that happened you know, 40 years ago. Okay, the other thing that makes conspiracy theories fairly different from delusions is that 50% of the American population believes in at least one conspiracy theory. So they're much more common beliefs uh, than are delusions. And this statistic has been shown in a couple of different studies. It's also been shown in different countries. So people sometimes ask me, what's my favorite conspiracy theory? Uh, the flat earth one is, it's not my favorite, but it is interesting for a couple reasons. It's one of the ones that I got most interested in and, and led me down the rabbit hole of, of learning more about conspiracy theories. So the belief in the flat earth to some extent is a scientific question. And, and some academic papers have been written about so-called flat earthers and how they're naive scientists who are trying to learn about the world. But to me, the cool thing about flat earth conspiracy theories is the conspiracy part. It's that in order for uh, the people who know that the earth is in fact flat, the government, NASA, governments from other, like the amount of cooperation internationally to keep something that profound secret just boggles the mind. And also the idea that the earth is round is like one of the most basic things that most people agree up upon, or so we think, right? And some people may have seen me in this documentary movie, that was my three minutes of fame. Um, in, in this uh, uh, documentary that's available on Netflix, which I thought was pretty good, independent of my appearance. So um, how many people, this is a US survey, how many people believe that the world is flat? So 84% say no, the earth is round. So that's a lot. But if you think about it, that's like 16% that either aren't sure, not, you know, don't think one way or another, or actually believe that the wor world is flat. I mean, that to me is, Pretty striking, right? In terms of the work we do in medicine, uh, certainly a lot being discussed these days about vaccines and vaccine beliefs. So uh, American survey, 13% of Americans believe that vaccines cause autism. Up to 30% are unsure, not, not sure what to believe about it. And the conspiracy part, 20% of Americans believe that the U.S. government knows that vaccine causes autism, but that the, the government's hiding it from all of us. And uh, to talk a little bit about some cultural issues. So if you look in the African-American community, there's some beliefs about HIV uh, that tend to be somewhat clustered and, and somewhat idiosyncratic. 
to the African American population. Over half of the sample in this particular study reported uh, that they believed that there was a cure for AIDS that being purposely withheld from the poor. Nearly half of the sample believe that HIV is a man-made virus. We're hearing a lot of that now about coronavirus, and maybe that's true, maybe it isn't. And again, within the African American community, it's been shown in a number of different studies that beliefs in those kind of conspiracy theories is associated with lower adherence to HIV care, preventative or otherwise. And so why should we um, care about conspiracy theories? Why are they relevant to those of us in the mental health profession? Well, a number of different studies have shown at least associational differences, uh, sorry, associations with conspiracy theories and things that I think are important, like, as I mentioned, abstaining from medically healthy behaviors, Racial prejudice, particularly anti-Semitism, is often associated with belief in conspiracy theory. Intent to commit crime, albeit measured in a psychology lab. Um, violent behavior, so who knows what QAnon is. Right, so I mean, there's been a lot written about QAnon and associations with extreme political movements and the sort of uh, intertwining of right-wing politics these days. And in fact, there's quite a bit written about politics, about conspiracy theories, papers variably suggesting that belief in conspiracy theories is associated with political disengagement, but also political extremism on the other end. I'll be saying a little bit more about this later in the talk, um, association with populist movements and authoritarian governments. And in fact, last year, the uh, FBI didn't really announce it, but the, it was released in one of their documents that the FBI FBI regarded conspiracy theorists, theories as a uh, domestic terrorism threat. Okay, so if I was going to summarize the literature on in psychology about uh, conspiracy theories, this is the slide. So in psychology, when um, researchers have tried to explain why people believe in conspiracy theories, they use this term called conspiracist ideation, which to me is a tautological thing. It's basically saying that People believe in conspiracy theories because they tend to gravitate towards conspiracy theories and think that they're interesting and cool. Um, now, if you look at studies of people who have these higher level conspiracist ideation, that's been associated with a number of other psychological variables, as, or as I like to call them, psychological quirks. So need for certainty, control, or closure. You can see, for example, how in the wake of something like the death of President Kennedy or Princess Diana, people feel um, upset, sad, but also searching for answers to make sense of why something like that would happen. So conspiracy theories have a certain appeal in terms of painting a narrative that kind of all makes sense. That's also related to something called a teleologic bias. Teleologic bias is something that we all possess to some extent, but some people really tend to want explanations that suggest there's a higher purpose or some ultimate cause to, to events rather than things happening randomly. Need for uniqueness, right? I mean, there's this idea in conspiracy theorists that they've stumbled on the right answer and all you people are sheep, and, but I know the truth. Um, and then uh, bullshit re receptivity is actually a psychological term. Uh, there is, in fact, a bullshit receptivity scale that I've used in, in forensic work. Uh, and, and it's a scale that essentially actually takes some, some somewhat well-known phrases by Deepak Chopra and uh, the people who are um, being administered the scale rate how profound they think those statements are, even though logically the statements are empty. So that's sort of a measure of bullshit receptivity. That's also associated with conspiracist ideation. And then sort of the converse of that, a decrease in analytic thinking. So that's a brief summary, and uh, Karen Douglas is probably the, the world's expert on conspiracy theories. That's an excellent review paper cited down at the bottom of that slide. Um, but I tend to think about conspiracy theories a little bit different, and again, I have this paper under review that's trying to sell the world to this idea. So I, I have proposed something called the two-component theory of uh, conspiracy theories. And I think the, what, what I'm trying to do here is show uh, a less pathological model, right? Again, we know that 50% of the, the population believes in conspiracy theories. So I don't think that necessarily thinking in terms of psychopathology is the right way to understand this. Um, so my uh, model involves two components, mistrust and misinformation. So let's talk about mistrust first. Um, this is not something I just invented. This is a, 
the idea that mistrust lies at the heart of conspiracy theories has been shown in a number of different studies, but it's not consistently measured in all of these types of studies, and how it's measured isn't, hasn't been standardized. So I think it's actually under-recognized. Um, and I think it's a, the issue of mistrust is particularly relevant to today's world, where if you look, this is a just hot off the presses Pew uh, study, Pew survey, looking at uh, the American population's rating of public trust in government. No surprise, it's not very good. In fact, it's arguably at an all-time low or, or close to it. <clears throat> Likewise, we have a, I'm, not, I'm trying not to talk too much about politics today, but um, we have a president who says that the media is the enemy of the people. And indeed, if you look at Americans' trust in media, you've seen a, we see a, a steady decline over the past 50 or so years. Um, and incidentally, there's actually a big gap between Democrats and Republicans, as you might um, expect. I think it's around 70, so 70 percent of Repu those who identify as Republicans don't trust the media, 30 percent. So the, there's a partisan difference, but overall, uh, trust in the mass media is poor. And then again, for the work we do, mistrust in science. So this is um, Atul Gawande gave a talk at the Caltech commencement a couple years back. And he said, few dismiss the authority of science. Like flat earthers don't think that science is BS. They think that scientists are biased or ill-informed or, or hiding the truth. So he says they dismiss the authority of the scientific community. And so if you look at those data from the uh, Research Center, indeed, uh, trust in the scientific community isn't declining, but it's actually never been all that good. It's been hovering in the 40% range for decades. And again, for the work we do in medicine, that actually has been declining, and trust in medicine and in the medical community is lower than it is even for scientists. The other reason I like to emphasize mistrust in understanding conspiracy theories is trust can be uh, isolated to one particular entity. So for example, you might, the bar there, what percent of Americans in the survey reported mistrust of specific federal institutions like the CDC or the FDA. So if I'm a so-called anti-vaxxer, maybe I have faith in NASA, so I believe the world is round, but I have uh, a lot of mistrust about, let's say, the FDA or the CDC and don't believe about vaccines. So why is trust a problem? And particularly in our country right now, why is it a problem around scientific belief? I think partly it's a kind of fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of science. I was always taught that research is called research because it's research. It's an iterative process of looking for repeated observations. There are scientific debates that are carried out not only in the academic literature, but I follow a couple different ones on Twitter, and it's kind of ugly sometimes when you see people arguing back and forth. I think a lot about how the public perceives that. These days, since we're arguably in the midst of a populist movement, there is a lot of thinking that researchers and people like that are in this audience that work in academic institutions are out of touch with the public. That we live in our ivory towers and we don't really understand what's happening on the ground. And then there's real life conflicts of interest. There's, a, you know, when you talk about uh, the anti-vax movement, a lot of that mistrust is rooted in the belief that we're all in bed with pharmaceutical companies. And then back to the idea that this is really more of a normative process than necessarily a psychopathological one, uh, there are real life trust violations. So uh, someone who does research and conspiracy theories specifically around the vaccine movement, Maya Goldenberg up in Canada, she's talked about how the anti-vax movement started in the UK, of course, related to the, the bogus research that uh, Andrew Wakefield did, but that occurred in the wake of the recent uh, bovine encephalopathy scare, which was widely, the UK government was widely criticized for mismanaging that scare, uh, not getting reliable information. And so when the uh, the vaccine data had come out, uh, the public was already ripe for being um, believing that they, they uh, should mistrust official sources. Likewise, I, I showed the slide about HIV beliefs in the African-American community here in the U.S. It's well known and, and been written about extensively that there's a long history of mistrust within the African-American community around medical care and perfectly warranted, right, if you look at things like the Tuskegee experiment. And so um, decades ago, that specific issue about mistrust in the African-American community was referred to as cultural paranoia, 
And now we're a little bit more enlightened. We now refer to that as cultural mistrust. So real trust violations sometimes underlie uh, this, and also real life scandals and fraud. Uh, just a couple interesting books out there. Uh, the one on the left basically makes an argument that the more we rely on experts, the more we mistrust them. It's actually a very interesting This American Life episode about NBA refs really talking about the same thing. Fascinating. Uh, Tom Nichols is sort of a, used to be a conservative who's now more, more of a liberal. He's written this, this book uh, called The Death of Expertise, talking about how right now the American public doesn't really believe or trust in experts. And he argues, uh, indeed, that uh, that's rooted in a decline of trust. And he makes a specific link to the democratization of knowledge that's occurred with the internet. So that's a good segue to the second part of my um, model of conspiracy theories, which is misinformation. So for me, the basic idea is that if you mistrust authoritative sources, then, and you're still looking for answers, what do you do these days? I love the word research, right? Because I run into people all the time, whether on social media or otherwise, and say, well, I've done my own research. And we know what that means, right? It means I type something into Google. So I think in order in this day and age to understand conspiracy theories, we also have to understand research coming out of information science. And conspiracy theories is an interesting topic because if I just did a literature search in, for example, the psychology literature, that would be a small amount of what's published. So in terms of information science, uh, sorry, this is me quoting myself again, but um, I don't like to use the term conspiracy theorist because it implies that someone's theorizing, right? Some sort of person who's very creative coming up with interesting ideas. So instead I say, although some conspiracy theorists are genuinely theorizing, Many are crafting a narrative based on a synthesis of available information and might be more appropriately described as conspiracy theorists. So in other words, people are getting online looking for things like vaccines and they're stumbling upon these narratives that are already there, supported by tons of people, and they say, oh, I kind of like that one. This one is not my own quotation, uh, but says a similar thing from a different angle. The problem of misinformation in the head, where individuals struggle to maintain <clears throat> inconsistent facts and memory, has been replaced by a problem of misinformation in the world where inconsistent information exists across individuals, cultures, and societies. So I think in order to understand conspiracy theories, we have to really tackle this issue of misinformation in the world. So I think uh, confirmation bias is pretty much a household world. Does anybody not know what confirmation bias is these days? I guess I, who knows what confirmation bias is? OK, so recently found this cartoon. So perfect illustration of confirmation bias. So the guy gets on the internet and says, I've heard the rhetoric from both sides. Time to do my own research on the real truth. Second one, Google hit. Literally the first link that agrees with what you already believe. Jackpot. So that's confirmation bias. That's present in all of us. It's well known to be found in scientists. Uh, we look for information that supports our pre-existing intuitions and beliefs. We reject information that contradicts it. So what's different these days on the internet, uh, some other, I think, words that are now uh, attaining household word status. We, uh, uh, once we're on the internet, we're operating within echo chambers, filter bubbles, which are deliberate attempts to kind of corral us to seeing what we want to see. And so um, I like to say that when you have confirmation bias and you have it in the online environment, that results in a kind of confirmation bias on steroids. And so let's take a quick tour through this. This is a recent article that came out in December about the uh, most popular health, um, viral health news, uh, often about fake health topics, so talking about cancer, uh, unproven cures about cancer, or about vaccines and their side effects. Back to the flat earth thing. Um, this is a very popular video uh, that's fairly recent, so it has almost a million views, two hour video, the 200 proofs that the earth is not a spinning ball. Um, Ashley Landrum is a, I forget, I think she's a psychologist. She's at uh, Texas Tech. She does research in conspiracy theories, and she went to a flat earth convention a couple of years ago uh, and interviewed people as part of an informal study. And she reported that for most of them, uh, most of the attendees of that conference, she asked them, well, where did you stumble upon the ideas about flat earth? And no surprise, their answer was the internet. Also, if we look at vaccines, this is the kind of thing that routinely appears on um, social media, on places like Twitter, claims about 
uh, that are false <laughs> about the measles vaccine. This was a 2009 study by Anna Kata, who's also in Canada. Um, so a little bit older data, but she was looking at Google searches for various keywords. If you typed in uh, back in 2009, vaccination, 71% of the hits were from uh, anti-vax sites. So where is all this online information coming from um, and why is it out there? So I think we all know the reason it's out there, at least in part, is because this is a money-making venture, right? We know from information science that fake news, quote unquote, travels faster and more widely than true information does. And we know that people just like suck this kind of stuff up. What's, um, <laughs> what's I think different these days is that you know 20 years ago, we recognized that misinformation was ubiquitous in the grocery store checkout line. Right, and you know, like I actually subscribed to the Weekly World News when I was in college. Um, but we kind of recognized that that was misinformation, whereas we trusted information that was quote unquote more mainstream. Now that we don't really consume print news and we don't think about information in that same way, that landscape has really changed. And so uh, we have people who seemingly are running news-like agencies. We have people who listen to what they say and go into pizzerias with a automatic weapon or semi-automatic weapon uh, to investigate a pornography ring run by Hillary Clinton, right? Because they heard about it in the news. So now, this is talk a little bit about politics. I think if there's a kind of weird irony, or maybe it's not weird at all, uh, but if there's an irony to conspiracy theories, it's that they're used as a political tool by shadowy vested interest groups who are trying to sway public opinion for one reason or another. So interesting New York Times article about who's funding the anti-vax movement. Uh, this is from the New Republic talking about uh, the conspiracy theories that are proliferating on the right wing. And I want to make clear also while I'm on this subject that there's mixed evidence, but there's not good evidence that conspiracy theories are only a conservative or Republican thing. It's well known that uh, people on the left, liberals, are just as likely to believe in certain types of conspiracy theories. So even though there is some partisan bias towards them in this era that we're living in currently, don't think of them as only a, a kind of foible that conservatives have. And so we now know that uh, online information comes from places like bots or trolls, Russian troll farms, and we believe that beyond profit, um, that they're also being used as a political tool. And again, in order to understand conspiracy theories, that means we have to know about psychology, we have to know about information science, and we also have to know a little bit about political science. And so again, we know that there's a long history of conspiracy theories being used as a form of political propaganda, often by so-called authoritarian countries, often to manipulate public opinion within the country, but also, also now we're very well aware that that happens uh, across uh, countries. And these days, uh, of course, we hear a lot about Russia in that regard. But this is not an exclusively Russian phenomenon. Uh, this study lo recently looked at online disinformation campaigns, mostly through social media. The vast majority of the countries have these campaigns. Uh, including, of course, the United States. And I'm not going to get too political, but uh, this is a great article published pretty recently in The Atlantic about our current president's use of conspiracy theories, how he uses them, why he might use them. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. So if we look at political science, the, this is Hannah Arendt. She's arguably the world's uh, authoritarian, she's now deceased, but was the world's author uh, authority on authoritarianism. Uh, so I love this quotation. If everyone lies to you, the consequence is not that you believe the lies, but rather that no one believes anything any longer, and with such a people you can do what you please. So this is kind of the dark uh, political side. You might argue it's actually conspiracy theory, but um, this is the dark political side of conspiracy theories that they're used, again, as a political tool not only to get people to believe in weird things that seem crazy, but to actually instill doubt in authority. And so along those same lines, it's now often claimed that we're living in a so-called post-truth era. 
I'm just going to quickly quote from this paper by Stefan Lewandowski. He's in, in the UK, writes a lot about misinformation, fake news, and conspiracy theories. Um, he says, imagine a world that considers knowledge to be elitist. Imagine a world where it's not medical knowledge, but a free-for-all opinion market on Twitter that determines whether a newly emergent strain of coronavirus is really contagious to humans. The dis this dystopian future is still just that, a possible future. However, there are signs that public discourse is evolving in this direction. So this was written a couple years ago. I argued that we actually are living in that future now. I think there's pretty good evidence of that. He goes on to say, um, misinformation misinforms with a potentially adverse impact on individuals in society. There are, however, several more insidious and arguably more dangerous elements. There's evidence that the presence of misinformation causes people to stop believing in facts altogether. We propose that most other post-truth claims similarly do not seek to establish a coherent model of reality. Rather, they erode trust in facts and reality to the point where facts no longer matter or are not even acknowledged to exist. Okay, so that's, that's basically my, my, my way of thinking about conspiracies. Mistrust is sort of the basis leading to vulnerability to misinformation. So I'll spend the remaining five minutes or so talking about what, if anything, we can do about this. And there's a fair amount of research being done on this, uh, again, coming from different disciplines. So hopefully I've made the case that before we really try anything, we have to think about the trust piece because we want to counter bad information, conspiracy theories, and other types of misinformation with good information. But the crux of getting people to believe things is to first make sure that people um, have trust. And so it's been said that uh, trustworthiness must come before trust. We can't put the cart before the horse. We have to think about how trust has been lost, and we have to think as people, um, voices of authority so-called, how to win that trust back. And so for those of us in medicine or in science, we have to think about how we communicate our findings to the public, knowing that the public might be skeptical of what we're talking about. For those of us who are clinicians, I think that the real way to get people to believe better information is through one-to-one -one relationships, not getting in Twitter wars. Um, I try to restrain myself for the vast majority of the time. And this was a nice little op-ed in the BMJ a couple months back, specifically talking about um, this very issue with regard to vaccines. And I like this one sentence, compassion is paramount. Rather than being dismissive of fears, the scientific and medical community must be mindful that patients especially are exposed to odious untruths. So we have to be understand why people believe in information before we try to reverse it. So part two is um, countering that in misinformation. Now, there's a lot of research that I'm not going to get into uh, that actually shows that a lot of strategies to counter misinformation are not very effective. Probably is not surprising to a lot of us. But I would also highlight a couple things. So I think we have to think about uh, correcting misinformation in a multi-pronged kind of way. The second two points I think are key. There's something called inoculation strategies, which are evidence-based. And this is telling people from the onset hey, you may very well be exposed to misinformation, be on the lookout for it. So warning people that they may encounter misinformation tends to make them a little bit more skeptical going in. Once the information's there and believed, it's harder then to correct. Uh, and then the last point is trying to do those inoculation strategies, trying to counter misinformation where it's occurring. So like Jim said, uh, some years ago, I decided that in addition to trying to get published in academia once in a while, I wanted to reach a wider audience. I didn't want to just reach my peers and colleagues. I wanted to try to reach the public. So uh, there's me plugging my blog, and you know, I do try to get on social media um, where I, I don't recommend it. It's, it's really not healthy. I think we'd be a better society if we all just unplug from social media. But for me, interested in this sort of thing, it's offered, I think, a very useful perspective on the kind of discussions that happen out there. Um, so there I am, I like to say, with my army of 2,000 Twitter followers, which is like nothing. So beyond that, uh, I think as a society we have, and as parents, I think we have to think about how can we retrain people in terms of scientific literacy and in terms of analytic thinking, which remember, decreased analytic thinking is associated with susceptibility to conspiracies. Um, this is something I just randomly ran into on the NPR Pollux politics podcast. It's a 15-minute talk on misinformation. I think it was so good. 
Uh, my child is only two years old, but he's going to listen to it when he's four and five. And so I think this kind of thing, you know, send it to your friends and real, like everyone should start with some basic information like this. I think a lot of us are familiar with charts like this that talk about media bias and what sources might be more reliable versus partisan or biased. I think this is something that we have to teach people you know, in first grade. This, uh, so for some reason, psychologists really love the word bullshit. But um, this is actually a college course taught at the University of Washington in Seattle uh, by two professors there. Uh, data reasoning in the digital world, trying to ferret out misinformation online, how to spot what's reliable or not. And so, and I've had some communication with these uh, folks. They have a curriculum, the syllabus up there on the top link. Wonderful stuff. But again, in my opinion, this should be an elementary school, not a college course. And finally, reducing mis misinformation in the big world. And we now hear a lot of these debates about social media or the major online media companies, what role should they have, should they be held account accountable, and what's the ideal balance between free speech, which we value in this country, but also controlling misinformation. If you haven't seen Carol Cadwallader's uh, TED talk, highly recommend this talk. She's a journalist who was really at the heart of the Brexit movement, talking about how social media uh, swayed the public to vote for Brexit. She has a number of great quotations where she's addressing Mark Zuckerberg and, and other, uh, others like that in the audience. She says, liberal democracy, democracy is broken, and you, the gods of Silicon Valley, broke it. This is not democracy, spreading lies and darkness, paid for by illegal cash from God knows where. So there's always like this conspiratorial element to those of us who are interested in conspiracy theories. But in any case, um, and indeed, around that same time at the early part of last year, YouTube, not so much Facebook, but YouTube actually made an effort to make conspiracy videos less prominent. So that statistic about the 71% of YouTube videos, uh, actually that was Google, but, but uh, so uh, when you type in uh, vaccination keywords on YouTube now, the anti-vax stuff isn't as prioritized. And of course, there's some people who are very upset with that. And then finally, for those of us in the forensic world, I think this is a fascinating uh, development where it's now people who peddle conspiracy theories and get people to believe them and do sometimes criminal things are indeed potentially liable now. So Alex Jones, um, recently one of his several lawsuits uh, ended up that he had to pay $100,000 because he was peddling the Sandy Hook um, conspiracy theory, the idea of the conspiracy actors, or sorry, crisis actors who were posing as fake parents. And that, as you can imagine, caused quite a bit of psychological trauma to the families that, that lost um, their loved ones. And so I mean, $100,000 isn't probably very much in the uh, Alex Jones bank account. But nonetheless, there's now this precedent that uh, this is litigatable. And that is my talk. All right, we have time for a couple of questions. Thanks, Joe. As always, uh, really interesting talk. So, my, so you showed a couple of slides uh, earlier on. So the first slide sh uh, showing that 50% of Americans believe in one conspiracy theory, uh, the decline of Americans' trust to media, and then and the unfortunately kind of dismally low trust in science kind of throughout time. So I'm curious, how you see um, our belief in, in conspiracy theories moving forward, and in, in particular, two two factors. So, is there a generational bias? So, um, baby boomers versus Gen X versus the millennial um, generation. And I don't want to make any too many um, assumptions, but you know, terms like hierarchical and authority are seen as negative things in uh, the, the millennial generation uh, when they don't necessarily have to be. And does that make them, I don't want to say them, but does that make us more susceptible um, to, to conspiracy theories because we're, we're less trusting of quote, authority and experts? And then the, the second question is kind of pseudo related. Um, how do you see the uh, regulatory development of, of cannabis being legalized? How is that going to affect people's uh, likelihood of believing some of these things? Interesting. Uh, so for the first part about whether or not there's sort of demographic, generational differences, 
there is some research suggesting that's true. In fact, I blew through it, but the slide showing trust in things like the CDC and the FDA, in that study, actually, young people had higher levels of trust. But, you know, what's the expression that, you know, they're supposed to teach teenagers? Never, uh, Jim, you're the, like the fountain of this. There you go. Thank you. Uh, right? Like that kind of skepticism is often built into our adolescence. So part of what I've argued in, in the paper that I wrote is that we do have to be careful about generalizing from one study to another. We can't just say that only old people are more conspiratorial because there's so many differences that do end up going around partisan lines or around specific things like faith and science. So I think it's hard to generalize for that reason. Um, so there's some evidence, though, actually suggesting that older people are more mistrustful. Anyway, about cannabis, so I have to think about that one. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not. Are you aware of any cannabis conspiracy theories? Um, right. Well, and certainly misinformation. Uh, and you know, cannabis is something I write about a fair amount, whether it's on social media or. Um, on my blog, and so I do think there's a lot of misinformation, and I, and I do think there's some parallels. And when I lecture about cannabis, I actually always talk about this. There's sort of what I call a philosophical difference. Those of us in medicine, when we prescribe medications, we kind of trust that process because we know it's been purified, it's been studied, there's dose finding, da 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 da. But that's not really where the way the general public thinks, right? The general public thinks, why are you withholding cancer drugs? Like, I have cancer, I just want to be able to try anything. And those of us in medicine, like, that's a terrible idea. So I think that same thing happens with cannabis, right? The general public, who, of course, many of them have used cannabis personally, say, no, like, why are you withholding this? And we're kind of the old, you know, dad who's saying, oh, we need to be cautious and study it. So I think there is that gap in terms of information there. And yes, I do think that researchers and clinicians have to be open to the potential for cannabis, uh, and I think we are, you know, we have the Cannabis Research Initiative here, um, while at the same time, time maintaining a healthy amount of skepticism. So I don't know if quite that answers what you're saying or not, but, but I think we have to really understand both sides of it and understand philosophically where people are coming from because they're not coming from the same kind of background we have in terms of the way we're taught to have faith in whether it's the FDA or medicines or in the role of pharma for that matter. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah, um, I love your emphasis on compassion and understanding where people are coming from. Um, when you see people constantly having, you know, not willing to examine their process of thinking um, it, and having very rigid thinking, uh, what do you usually do? Do you, I mean, if there's one thing you don't want to. You don't want to get straight to the facts lots of times because they're not interested in, right. in that. Yeah, uh, great question. And like you're about compassion, Jim taught me everything I know about compassion as a clinician. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, so as to your question about the approach, I mean, I actually, back to my original quoting myself about learning about the normal brain through disease states, you know, most of my clinical experience is working with delusional patients. And I think for those of us who work with that population, we kind of know how it goes, right? You empathize or sympathize with the distress and then get at the belief that way. It's not an argument where I'm saying, well, I think this is reality and I think you're delusional. Like, yeah, that's not going to get you anywhere. So, in fact, the framework that we see in cognitive behavioral therapy actually, I think, should or could be applied to conspiracy theories. I think the difference, of course, is that I'm not aware of that many people who believe in conspiracy theories who are help-seeking in the way that people who go seek CBT. So that's the big question. Um, beyond that, I would say, and I always recommend that, that my number one rule is not to attempt any of the stuff you're talking about in social media. <laughs> I think that's just doomed to fail. Uh, and I've experienced it firsthand where it's like, I get irked and I wanna argue and like, you know, I have to restrain myself. So I think that's just a horrible environment. I think we have to do it one-on-one, -on -one, whether we're talking about our patients or we're talking about Thanksgiving dinner and you know Uncle Freddy or you know I have a first-degree family member who voted for someone that I'm not very happy about. So I mean, so we all have that experience where we have to, well, we don't have to, but we encounter people with very divergent beliefs. And I think if that's gonna move forward at all, it has to start by really, like any therapist knows, listening. 
right? Listening, cataloging, understanding why someone believes that way, and that then perhaps once a trusting relationship has been established, maybe now we can chip away at that through CBT or you know whatever other psychotherapeutic techniques. But you know the person has to be there to have that conversation. I noticed uh, conspicuously absent on your slide uh, comparing delusions with conspiracy theories is the key feature of delusions, which is that they're fixed right. and resistant to evidence and logic. And it occurred to me, maybe you didn't put it there because it pretty much is the same on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. You know, you can't argue with people's delusional beliefs. You become part of the delusion. Right. And I guess with conspiracy theorists, the more you argue, the more that's proof that the conspiracy theory is true. Right. And you're one of the people promulgating it. Right. So exactly. So I think that conviction, uh, of course, conviction's on a spectrum, even in, within delusions. But cons conviction is absolutely shared. Right? That's what makes them hard to differentiate because there's still beliefs that many people find very fringy and odd, but the person believes it tenaciously. So again, the differences are, are the other aspects. Um, yeah. Uh, there was a slide you showed of the brain. I think it was the Karen Douglas uh, summary article. So um, about various character psychological characteristics. So I just want to make sure I understood that. Does that mean that people who are more prone to conspiracy theories have been studied in the psychology research lab and have been found to have these various factors, not necessarily only about their conspiracy theories, but in general? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, every one of those things, there's been at least one paper, if not multiple, suggesting an associational connection. I mean, my, my critique, not criticism, but critique of that literature is that unfortunately, and conspiracy theory research is relatively recent, I'd say really in the past decade. Um, there's this paper that says, oh, there's this association between need for closure and conspiracy. This other paper finds something different because they're not looking at all the same variables. So, and my personal belief there is that it might depend on the, the way we're asking about conspiracy theories and also which ones. That's why I gave the, the example about JFK or Princess Diana. So yes, each of those has been uh, based on research looking within a certain study, but very few people have been looking all, at all of those variables across studies. So we're, we're still you know, in, a, in a state of research inf in infancy from that perspective. Thanks so much, Dr. Pierre. I really appreciate you coming there. All right, thank you.